good uh, afternoon. It's 12:24 on Monday, the 23rd of October, 2017. It's supposed to be Calculus 3, Math 1, 227. However, I'm the only one in the room right now, so we'll go on and get started. Hopefully, some will be coming in as we progress. But uh, let's get started from where we are. A couple of announcements. Uh, There is, I, I saw this on the wall, a poster on the wall, that this coming Friday, I think it's a UAB production of The Taming of the Shrew will be uh, held on um, the Birmingham East Campus in the A.G. Gaston Auditorium. Um, from, it's a Shakespearean play, but it sounds like the producers or whoever have been very creative with it and uh, have turned the, the roles around rather than a very difficult woman. Uh, the man trying to tame her is the very difficult man and the woman's trying to tame him. Uh, I don't know any more about it than that, but it's, uh, I believe, Friday at 10 o'clock uh, Birmingham East Campus, A.G. Gaston Auditorium. So I believe it's free admission. If you'd like to see it, that should be, uh, it's a comedy. And evidently they made it even more of a comedy by turning the roles around. I don't know. But anyway, you're welcome and encouraged to go see it. I uh, can't think of anything else too new here. <clears throat> I do know that uh, the... Uh, Spring schedule will, should be coming out relatively soon, sometime within the next week or so, I would think. So you should be able to start uh, registering for that. Um, I don't know of any changes to my office hours, so uh, as far as I know, this week is should be back somewhat normal again. Monday, Wednesday, 3.15 to 5.15, Tuesday, Thursday, 12.15 to, no, 1.15 to uh, 3.15 will be my office hours and on Friday uh, 745 to 1145 however I may have a meeting on Friday they have been saying it would be every fourth Friday that's this coming up but I haven't seen any new word on it so I don't know for sure if that's happening all right today we were just going to go over I think I passed out to you last time your uh, test for chapter the last section of 12, and in fact, I think it was a while back, but we finished uh, all that were co was covered on that test. But I did want to uh, just show you a little bit this uh, slideshow on planetary motion according to Kepler and Newton, because these are potential paper topics. Um, Kepler, who was Kepler, and also who was Newton. And uh, basically what happened um, Kepler um, had developed these laws of planetary motion experimentally. Okay, he had uh, taken very careful and had, had, had used other people's very, very careful measurements of planets and, and information about the planets and developed this. Uh, law is called Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion and it was what they call an empirical law based only on evidence okay but had no way to explain why this was correct um, and uh, Isaac Newton took that as a challenge and developed his three laws of motion which then uh, explain planetary motion according to what Kepler had seen. So here are basically his three laws of plan uh, planetary motion are illustrated right here. Um, not that you have to do anything with them, you're not going to be tested on this, but it's, it's pretty uh, a useful bit of history and science and mathematics that all go together. Here is the first. Uh, this is called the law of ellipses, that a planet travels along an ellipse 
and the son is always one of the two foci, foci of, an, of that ellipse. Uh, an ellipse, a circle is a, uh, a curve that every point on the curve is equal distance from the center. Okay, that's what makes it a circle. An ellipse has two foci, right? Now the, this one focus, the center, has two with the sun at one, um, then the planet follows an elliptical orbit, which sometimes is closer to the sun and sometimes is further away. Now this is probably an exaggeration from any of our planets. I think most of the planets are near circular orbits. They're not ever exactly, they are elliptical, but this is an, is an exaggeration. So this shows a planet traveling along an ellipse with the sun at one focus, okay? And basically that is the first law. But also things that are colored here, the, um, that green region that you see here in this figure, that's what they call the um, area And that leads to the second law, the area that the path covers in, in a certain time period. So we'll see that in the second uh, of the uh, laws. So here are Kepler's three laws, okay? And as I said, they were later pro proven uh, and substantiated by uh, Isaac Newton. Okay, the first law of ellipse is the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. That's already stated. Okay, number two, the law of equal area and equal time. The position vector, it is so good to see you cut one. I get really sick of talking to myself. Okay, so Jasmine. Um, did I give you the test last night? Yeah. Okay. Um, this room is a bit on the chilly side. Yeah. I'm just like the chilly Yeah. The, uh, this morning, of course, I have a large class first thing in the morning, but they also don't turn on the ventilation system until right at 8. So the body, the building sort of, you know, builds up a little bit of heat overnight, and then they turn on the system. But I had a big class in here, probably close to 30 students in here this morning, so it wasn't bad. And then my next class was only two students, but they uh, it hadn't cooled off that much by then. But boy, then over lunch, and maybe because I drank not super cold water, but really cold water. I am in there freezing, so, yeah. So anyway, as I was saying, uh, section 3.6 is not, I'm not going to test you on this, but it is good, solid mathematics, science, that you should know and, and be at least familiar with. And it's Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. The first of these being that the orbit of every planet is an ellipse, with the sun at one focus. I don't know if you remember how you define what an ellipse is. An ellipse has two foci, and uh, if you were to, say, tie a string, uh, attach a string to each focus, and then take a pencil and, and go the maximum length you could, stretch it out, you know, keeping that string taut between those two foci, that, uh, that shapes an ellipse for you, okay? And this would be the sun at one of those foci. All right, the second I was just going over was the law of equal area and equal time. The position vector pointing from the sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas and equal times, which means that, and I'll go back and, and show you the figure here. Uh, now, this isn't drawn up to, to illustrate this exactly. But it's, uh, I'm going to use it for that. Well, wait a minute. That is. <laughs> I, it, I went ahead. So let's, 
actually let's um, do this. This is the uh, illustration of that second law. Uh, when an object is going in an elliptical orbit, and this is the sun being the focus of that, the planets move much faster when they're closer to the sun, and they slow down the further out they get from the sun. Now, again, I've said this before you came in, most planetary orbits are not this elliptical. They're all slightly elliptical, but usually the foci are closer together than this one. This is drawn for illustrative purposes, okay? And this is saying that since the particle, the planet is moving more rapidly here, it goes from A to B in the same time that it goes from C to D there, okay? And in that time going from A to B, it sweeps the same area as it does from C to D, okay? Uh, sort of surprising, you might think, but that seems to be the case. What's the most surprising thing is that Johannes Kepler was able to deduce all this based just on observations, empirical data, without actually having how he, if he got that precise of data, I'm not sure, but he did come up with that law. That's the second law. First, that the planets do go in elliptical orbit. Number two, the area of the, is swept out by a planet in a given time area is the same throughout its orbit around the sun. Okay? So that's the second law. Equal areas and equal time. Now the third law, his third law, is one that's even more mystifying how he came up with this, just analyzing data that he had. The law of the period of motion. Now, the period of motion is how long it would take the planet to get from any given point all the way around the sun and back to that point again. That's its period. It's the time, okay? And what his, at least as I understand his original claim, the square of the period is proportional to the length of the semi-major axis cube. Okay. The square of the period is proportional to the length of the semi-major axis cube. Okay, this being the proportionality constant, four pi squared pi is just a constant, four is a constant, pi squared is a constant, divided by g, which is the universal gravitational constant, which is a rather uh, big unusual number, but it's what we use all the time in, in physics and M is the mass of the sun, in other words, the body about which you're revolving. And that's a huge number there, uh, G being a fairly small number. And uh, you multiply that by the mass of the sun, and you've got a pretty hefty number there. Okay. All right. I think that's all we can say about that one. Here is, I'm not going to dwell on this too long, just wanting to um, Isaac Newton, as I said before, well, of course, let's go back one, two, okay. This third law, when Kepler did it, I'm pretty sure I would almost be confident to say, it always says the period square is proportional to the length of the semi major axis. Okay. I can almost bet you he didn't have this constant proportionality. He may have had a numerical value, but he didn't have it broken down this way, and here's why. Newton is the one who came up with this law of universal uh, gravitation, the universal gravitational constant. 
So my guess is that number wasn't even known at the time that Kepler did this. Kepler may have had a numerical value that he knew it was proportional to, but he didn't have this breakdown of what the components of that are. Okay? It was just a number. So, Here is the differential equation, and this, I'm pretty sure, is what Newton developed. Okay? Is that the second derivative, because they didn't have derivatives before Newton, okay? The second derivative of the displacement vector, okay, is equal to, and again proportional to, the um, unit radial vector, okay? Um, that's the vector coming from the Foci, and it's in the opposite direction of that, and some constant k over the magnitude of this r squared. Okay, so that's the basis of that differential equation is the basis of Newton's proof or validation of Kepler's three laws. Okay, uh, this figure illustrates that, what I just was saying, that the um, uh, gravitational force L, which is directed toward the sun, that's the sun here, planet here, the gravitational attraction on the line in between the two, so it has to be pointed in that direction. The attractive force being pulled toward the sun. Gravitational force L is directed from the planet to the sun. It's a negative of the multiple of this E vector. Okay? This is the vector here, force vector. This is the radial vector, and of course it's in the negative direction of that, which we saw in the previous uh, formula. Okay? There. Minus E bar, okay, E, uh, radial unit vector, okay. Now, and again, I'm pretty sure this was Newton. I don't want to say it for sure. But besides that differential equation we just showed, the key to Kepler's second law, the second law, the areas being swept is the fact that the following cross product is a constant vector even though both r and r prime are changing in time okay the vector j is constant where j is defined to be the cross product of the direction vector the displacement vector uh, across to the velocity vector and this is going to be a vector points up. Uh, and this is called the linear momentum um, angular, I'm sorry, la angular momentum, I'm here of the linear, angular momentum vector. Uh, okay. <coughs> I was just seeing if there's anything else there. Uh, Goodness, I'm cold. Uh, here's theorem one that relates. Yeah. I'm double the class size. All right. Freddy's here. Go right. well, ahead, Victor. We have 100% thinness. Okay. And this angular momentum vector. Uh, is a constant no matter where you are in your path okay now remember displacement is along the radial vector from sun to the planet the velocity is tangential to the path and so this vector would be pointing upwards and that's uh, uh, 
the cross product then would be perpendicular to the first of those, so it would be pointing in neither direction, but it was perpendicular to both. And uh, that is a constant vector. That's the height of singing like crazy. You shouldn't be rubbing on something making you guess. Okay, so again, you're not responsible for this section. This is just basic information for those applications of that. I'm not going to test you on it, but it's stuff that, you know, it's just good general scientific knowledge. Kepler's laws of motion and Newton proof of that. So, in other words, that vector is a constant vector as the uh, object the planet goes around the sun is a constant direction and constant magnitude. So its first derivative is zero. Does it change direction or magnitude? Okay, that's just my eyes. All right. This is a figure toward the bottom of page 732. Um, okay. I think that's sort of tied up in the proof there, so I'm not going to do a whole lot with that. I'll blow it up for you so you can see it a little better. But, uh, all right, there's that, but I think it's mostly part of the proof. All right. Twitchy, I can hardly focus. Okay, now I can see zoom in now, but it took effort. All right. <coughs> now, here's theorem two. I don't think you need to know anything. That let me just sort of explain it to you. Uh, if J is a constant like we said in theorem one, uh, then if little j here is, uh, not little j, the tau size j is the magnitude of the j vector, the angular momentum vector, which we saw was constant by theorem one, then <sighs> what is the magnitude of that? It's your R Momentum is mass times the velocity, so linear momentum. Angular momentum would be uh, the theta would be its uh, the, the angle that's being moved and the rate at which that's happening. That would be in per second times uh, r squared, so that would be meter squared per second, which doesn't sound like a very useful unit. Uh, meter per second would be a uh, linear velocity, but a uh, leak squared per second, 
this is what we said about being, is closer to being what we think of as angular momentum. The time rate of change at which the angle is changing multiplied by its displacement is a kind of a crude way of expressing it. Okay. Again, I'm not sure I should be spending this much time on these because these are kind of esoteric formulas that you very seldom actually read. Uh, so the magnitude of the displacement vector is the magnitude of the displacement vector. It's two different ways to write it. Tau times means magnitude, so it means bar. Here is your radial vector, okay, unit radial vector, cosine sine. By all the way through is that's the direction that something is pointing along the path. Okay? E theta would then be the negative reciprocal of that. E theta would be negative sine cosine theta. And then the dot product of the uh, angular. angle vector and the unit radial vector um, would be uh, they're perpendicular to each other so the dot product would be there. Okay. Goodness gracious. Ugh. Now the unit vector E to R, that's the radial vector, and E to theta, which is the uh, they are orthogonal to each other. I usually think of the the angle vector. I usually picture it up here, not here, but it's certainly fine to put it any place you want to. But you see by placing it here, equal unit length and radial vector, the, the rate at which the, uh, the, the motion of the, how the theta is increasing over time, that is the, uh, I don't know, time is the part, but that's your uh, E to theta. They are orthogonal. They rotate around the origin along with the planet. Okay, so they go around like they're keeping that orthogonality all the time uh, as e r points to the planet, wherever it happens to be, r of t. Okay, and these are. Characteristics of them. The change in the radial vector as a function of theta will give you the displacement vector within the uh, uh, within their confines, you might say. Now, as you change your, your direction, remember the magnitude doesn't change, it's only the direction. As that direction changes, in the direction of the increase in e theta. Okay? But as e theta is changing, the rate of change of that is opposite to the direction of the unit tangent vector. Okay. Now, I'm not sure this is something that's worth, certainly not worth memorizing, but uh, basically what they did here was do the product rule with these two vectors. Uh, e theta is in e sub r. The change of e sub r with respect to time would be the change of uh, well, again, I don't think this is all that worthwhile for you the time rate of change, okay, and this is the time rate of change here. Uh, 
primary sanctus is CR by the same rule would be the DE to say that you say that you see that would be to say that you see on the two circuits. Um, and Uh, a more direct way to, to say this, but if you think about it sort of in kind of looks like a chain rule type situation here, this is D E D T and that is D E D theta D theta D T. Well D theta D T is the same as theta prime and D E D T as we just saw in the slide or two ago, that is Units axis in the theta direction. So that's all where that came from. Okay, let's see. I can't even see this one. It's so small. And that didn't get a lot bigger. All right. Your change of velocity, we kept uh, both these for velocity. For unit time, that's going to be your acceleration. And your acceleration always with the curved motion is towards the center of the curvature. Okay? So that's going to be in the direction of ER, which is the radial vector. But it's going to be in the negative direction of that because ER is pointing outwards, this is pointing inwards. Because that's the change of velocity of acceleration, centripetal acceleration. And that happens to be. Coefficient of K R T squared. Uh, it's okay that they write it this way. I prefer to do the R squared T. It showed up before. I didn't make a big deal about it, but I just you could almost confuse yourself to think that was T squared. It's not. It's R squared. R at T squared. What's that? All right. Boy, this is going a lot longer than I thought it was going to go. Uh, if you were to integrate that that we just had up there, uh, d theta dt, I mean dv dt, and, and put those uh, component parts there, Uh, I think this is it's sort of a voila type statement. They maybe in the text they built up to it, but it's, it seems to leave a lot to be desired. Uh, the theta dt remember is in the e of t direction and the e of and the e of r direction, and that that vector is cosine theta sine theta. That is your e r. Because it's a unit vector, and that is a unit vector in that direction. These, this is the coefficient of it, okay. And whereas this is the minus here, if you split these two and negate them, then you lose the minus sign here, but you move it in there. Well, I mean, think of this: the antiderivative of cosine is sine antiderivative of uh, uh, sine is negative cosine. Uh, so that then flips the direction of that and you negate that, so that's why you lose the minus here and you pick up the minus in front here. And this, by the way, is e theta, okay? So it's k over j e theta plus one constant c. So basically, we almost gotten around, and by the way, your velocity vector is in the direction of increasing theta. It's k 
tangential. And this is tangential, this one was regular. And sure enough, the directions and, and the applications are pretty much what you would expect. Now, this looks a lot more complicated. Uh, this is a greatly exaggerated figure. The perihelion of an orbit shifts slowly over time. Uh, so, for instance, for Mercury, perihelion is the closest point, okay, and where that actually lines up, it shifts slowly over time. For Mercury, the semi-major axis makes a full revolution approximately once every 24,000 years, okay? So that means that the uh, that is changing ever so slightly. Now, let's not do Mercury, let's do Earth. And Earth is a near circular orbit, but isn't a circular, it's slightly elliptical. And right now, uh, our perihelion is the time when we're closer to the sun. Now remember, I said we're, we're nearly circular, so the sun is almost at the center of this, these ellipses aren't nearly as oblong as they're looking now. They're looking more and more like circles, but they're not quite. Uh, our uh, rotation around the sun. Um, and right now, the our closest point to the sun, perihelion, is, believe it or not, in January, early January. And our I can't remember how to call it. It's the opposite, it's the one that starts with A. Uh, it's early July, okay? But it's the tilt of the uh, Earth to the Sun. Let's say this is Earth, and again, this is greatly accentuated. That's what gives us summer or winter the tilt and the direct radiation. Even though we're a little bit closer, not a lot closer, in the winter time, but if anything, that should make the northern hemisphere moderate its extremes of temperature and would accentuate the extremes of temperature in the southern hemisphere. But they won't always be like this because the perihelion advances so slowly, making a complete all the way back around to here again in 24,000 years. So that's going to be a while. You know, not during our lifetime will it change much. Certainly mine. I don't have that much left. And this again is the figure we saw way early in the beginning. And uh, I think this may be in the yeah, it's in the summary. Uh, and it's just that the, the planets do follow elliptical orbits. They're not just exaggerated. They're usually close to the circular, but they all are slightly elliptical. The area that a planet traces in a given time period, no matter where it is, the areas are the same. That's the second law. And the third law is that the period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis. That's from the center to here. That's the semi-major axis A to the third power. That probably took longer than it should have, but there's several potential paper topics in there if you're interested in, in choosing one of those. All right. That's it for chapter 13. Again, I gave both of you the test last time, right? And that's uh, 12, 6, or whatever it is on the quadric surfaces through 13, 5, basically. That's all it is. There is also another blurb, historical perspective, and this is talking about the Hubble Space Telescope, produced the um, image of the antenna galaxies, okay, a uh, pair of spiral galaxies that began to collide hundreds of millions of years ago and are still 
doing so. Now, remember a galaxy is all billions of stars, okay? But they're way far apart from each other. So when they say they collide, there's no, there's not much chance of anything ever touching. It's just they're going through each other. And it's rather bizarre to think of because there's so much more space between them than they're occupying that the odds are none of the things are ever going to collide. Now, what would be interesting and probably devastating if they collided in such a way that black holes actually came close to each other? I don't know what would happen then. I mean, that would be weird. But anyway, you... Uh, uh, if you read this little blurb, you'll see several of the people, uh, Tycho Brahe, Galileo, Galileo, Kepler, um, and uh, Einstein's central theory of relativity. You just got all sorts of things in that. Uh, so this can't be a source for your paper. It can be plenty of ideas, so there is that. And the other thing, I was just going to see if any of the questions would lead to, lead to paper topics. They may. I don't see anything especially that stands out to me. All right. Why did that? Was that up? Okay. Let's go on and get out of Chapter 13. Why didn't it not? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Sorry, I had it and I lost it. There it is. All right, moving on to fourteen. Open things take forever. Okay, start at fourteen one. Now, to me, the stuff that we were doing, <coughs> uh, basically vector calculus. That's important. That that calculus three type material. But to me, this chapter and the next one are the real key to Cal three. So hopefully we'll get through this one and the next one. And then if we have time for any others. But this to me is the more important part of, uh, of Calculus 3. Not that any are any more important than others. But here is a, uh, now obviously if you got your book, you see this isn't the same figure as they're showing there. But this is the famous triple peaks of the Iger Launch and uh, Young Frau, I think is this one back here, uh, in the Swiss, Swiss Alps, yeah. Uh, the steepness at a point in a mountain range is measured by a gradient, and we're going to define that term in this chapter. But notice here, this is, this is a path along the ridge, and you see you've got slope increasing this way, slope increasing that way, and slope increasing that way. So what ties all those together is this concept of gradient. You know, obviously the gradient here as you're getting near the peaks is really steep. Here it's pretty mild in this direction, maybe a little steeper in these two directions, but we will be dealing with what we term the gradient. Okay? It'll be a few sections in. So let's start where we can. Here's another figure. This one is in the text. And this is global climate is influenced by the ocean, and they call it the conveyor belt system. Oh, let me blow this up. Sorry. Okay. The ocean conveyor belt a system of deep currents, really deep, driven by variation in water temperature. Okay? It's really hard to say 
where you're starting because there's several pathways here. But let's start somewhere here, say, in the South, South Atlantic, Southeastern Atlantic Ocean. And these, I'm pretty sure, are certain currents this way, and these are deep currents that way. Okay? The surface current here, I think that's part of the Gulf Stream, which basically takes warm equatorial waters and keeps all of the eastern coast of the U.S., all of the eastern coast of the U.S., ice free in the wintertime and pretty moderate temperatures. Okay? And, Britain gets benefit from it because it carries on over here. It keeps most of, of the British Isles ice free in the wintertime. As high up as they are, they should be frozen. And you get over here to Denmark and some areas here which don't aren't on that conveyor belt. They freeze like crazy there, and they're the same latitude pretty much that Great Britain is. Okay, it gets cold in northern Scotland. You know. Really cold, but their ports still don't freeze. Where it is, can you maybe get anything over there? Yeah. But then they dip and dive and come back, and the deep currents take the cold water here and move them through equatorial areas down to cold water here, and then back up in the Pacific, floods mix them around, and they come back up more in surface currents here. Uh, some of these short circuits can go up into the Indian Ocean, then come back like this. Others make a long trip around to the uh, Pacific Ocean. The whole idea here is the waters mix. Now, they may take two million years to completely mix, but it's something like that. And this does affect global climate because you have deep cold water coming to the surface. You have warm waters going down. And doesn't want to go down, but ultimately it goes up there and cools off and then goes down. Okay. Um, yuck. Why did it do that? This is doing some squirrely things today. Okay. This is better, I think. Okay. They said the currents are driven by salinity or, or density differences. This is a conductivity temperature depth instrument used to measure seawater variables such as the density of the water, the temperature of the water, the pressure of the water, and the salinity of the water. Now, they left out one, the conductivity, which is a third of that. So here's the seawater density, rho, kilograms per cubic meter, as a function of temperature and salinity. As your temperature increases, that tends to decrease your salinity and decrease the density. This is density here. Uh, well, I shouldn't have said salinity, density here. Notice water usually is 1.00, that's fresh water. Salt water is a little denser. And as the temperature goes up, because the molecules get further apart, the density goes down. Very slightly, three decimal places, four decimal places I would chalk. But if the salinity is increasing as well as salt content, then that increases the density of the water. So you have both of these factors going on here, changes the temperature, changes the salinity, and the combination of those affects the density. This is the greatest density on this corner, the widest is the lowest density on that corner. Okay. And what you're describing there are gradients. How are things changing in two dimensions? These are independent variables, temperature and salinity, completely independent of each other, but they both contribute to a third variable, which is density. This is an example of multivariable uh, differentiation in several variables. Okay. A lot of blah, blah, blah here, okay, uh, before we actually start solving or calculating anything. Okay. What we have here, 
represented here is a domain which is x y plane. Okay? In other words, x and y are not dependent on each other at all, but they're both independent variables of something else. So the domain as a function of x and y, this indicates you've got two independent variables, whereas before we say y is a function of x, x is a dependent variable, I'm sorry, sorry, dependent variable, y is the independent variable. Yeah, I said it backwards again. X is the independent variable, y is the dependent variable. Now we've got f as a function of x and y. Both of these are independent variables, and what the f is representing is a dependent variable, instead of z or whatever, okay? And here would be an example. The square root of 9 minus x squared minus y. Well, as a function of x, a function of y, has nothing to do with each other, uh, but that defines the domain, and your domain is this parabola here. Set this equal to zero, basically, well, zero. Say y is equal to uh, minus x squared plus nine. Okay, yeah, you would set that equal to zero. Y is equal to because in the z plane, this is, the xy plane is where z is equal to zero. So whatever this is when it's zero, that would be your defining range here. Y is equal to uh, minus x squared plus nine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this to the other side, minus x squared plus nine. And you see the minus x squared means you're pushing downward, plus nine, that would be your, your y-intercept. This is the area on which this function is operating. It's not operating out here, that's not in the domain of the area. But this is in the domain of the area, okay? So of all points lying below the parabola, you might say inside the parabola, uh, y is equal to nine minus x squared, minus x squared plus nine. Okay, here's another one. This is the domain of a three-dimensional plane. So you have uh, independent variables x, y, and z with some dependent variable on the outside. So this is dependent on this. And here is your, um, your function g is x times the square root of y plus log of z minus 1. Okay? It's independent variables x, y, and z. And there's the function that tells you what to do with those independent variables. They don't relate one to another. It's a set of points with, and obviously y has to be greater than or equal to zero because you can't take the square root of it otherwise. So your y, now, your, you've heard of right hand rules, right? Okay, point your, on your right hand, point your fingers in the direction of x, bend them in the direction of the positive y, and your thumb is going to be pointing in the direction of z. Okay, I can't twist my arm around to get it to do right, but it, it would be. So here, your y's have to be greater than or equal to zero. So that plane right back there, that goes along the x-axis, you can't have any negative y's, so this box comes out in this direction of y, okay? X is unlimited, it can go negative or positive, no limitations on x there. Z, however, you take the log of z minus 1, okay? Logs cannot be 0 and they cannot be negative, okay? So that means z equal 1, it can't even be that. Well, this is hard to see, but this is all raised up. You see a little trace of something here. Everything's raised up one unit off the xy plane, and that's z greater than 1. Not greater than or equal to, but greater than 1. So your z's are above one, your x's are, are positive, and your, I mean your y's are positive, your x's go anyway. That's now the domain of some other function, okay? Who knows, that could be temperature of the atmosphere. You have three dimensions of the atmosphere, and this could be something to do with temperature, with pressure, with something else. So this g could be anything that's dependent on the entire atmosphere. So you see you can have more than one independent variable. 
two in this case, three in that case. Theoretically, yeah, but I can't think anything beyond three space. Okay. Now, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. This first one here, I was just going through the figures. I hadn't realized we had hit, actually hit an example here. And here's Victor, 100% attendance, ding, 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 good deal, okay. Example one was sketch the domains of f of y, f of x, y is equal to the square root of 9 minus x squared minus y, okay. Sketch the domain of that. Well, here it is, they sketched it for you, so I'm sorry about this, I should have seen it. Uh, so what you do... If you think of this, this is a function of x and y, and it's a square root function, which means it's a positive function. You can't have any negative values here for l, because it's a positive principal square root. Could be zero, but can't be negative. So therefore, its domain would be where z is equal to zero, the third dimension is equal to zero, and this would be it. And where that's equal to zero, where root goes away, this would be equal to zero, and that would be y is equal to 9 minus x squared. It would be y to the other side. And that would be the domain of that. All the points inside that. Okay? The b part here, g is equal to that one. So these are the two functions that he gave us. And then it says sketch the domain. Well, the domain of this one, y has to be greater than zero, greater than or equal to the z has to be greater than 1 because you can't take the uh, log of 0, but you can of any positive number, so that would be z is greater than 1. And the x is no restriction there. Oh, positive or negative, so they go infinitely in both directions. y goes infinitely in one direction, z is infinitely in one direction, and x is infinitely in two directions. Those were the drawings that they were asking for in example one. So these maybe have something to do with the example two. Sketch the graph of f of x, y is equal to 2x squared plus y, 5y squared. Okay. I see nothing on here that looks like that's supposed to be uh, but they do say figure five. Oh, there it is. Okay. Right. This is figure four. That's figure five. Let's blow this up. Okay, these first two are figure four, which we really didn't say too much about. It was in the graphing function of the two variables. Basically what it's saying, here's a graph of one independent variable. X is your independent variable, Y is your dependent variable, Y is equal to F of X, there you have it. Vertical line test, all that kind of stuff. This is what we've done. Everything in calculus we've done up to now. Now we have a graph that Z is equal to the function of X and Y. X is coming this way, or going that way. Y is coming out of the board, into the board, and your graph, Z, is some surface that depends on both X and Y. Not just a curve that depends on X alone. This is a surface that depends on X and Y covering the same area. Now this shows not a fantastic drawing, but it shows mound here, three-dimensional mound here, and one here with an indentation here. And you see sticking out under each other. So uh, that is an example of a graph. G is equal to f of x, y. Okay. All right. Now, example Two was sketch the graph of y is equal to uh, 
2x squared plus 5y squared. Okay. Ah. That's the wrong sheet. Okay, that's about the best I can do. Okay. Now, that looks like a paraboloid to me. Okay? And that's exactly what it is. The uh, horizontal traces here form ellipses. So at any given f of x, y, or z value here, there is 1, 2, x squared, and 1, 5, y squared. cross-sectional areas where this is constant are ellipses, okay? Major X is on Y and minor X is on F, on, on X. <coughs> um, however, if you did a cross-sectional trace in either the dimension uh, YZ plane or the XZ plane, you would get F of XY, that would be your uh, vertical Y, then you would have a parabola, Z is equal to 2Y squared if you cut this way, or 2X squared, or 5Y squared if you cut that way. So, I kept thinking they had shown that, but that's been marked, so it's probably on the board. Uh, the cross section of this would be parabola in either dimension when either x or y is constant, and z and the other allows the expansion. Okay. Well, I mentioned traces and level curves. That's the next thing they're going to talk about here, which is stuff that we did in 12.6 or wherever it was. Uh, okay. Now. Drawing three-dimensional surfaces on a two-dimensional board is a challenge. I'm so thankful and grateful they've done it, but it's still hard to visualize. Um, this first display here, they have X traces coming out of the board, Y parallel to the board that way, kind of, you know, and then X tells Y, right now you will be with the up, just what it is. Board is not quite this X, Y, Z plane, but close to it, and X is coming out this way. Now, notice here, when you are moving in the first quadrant of X, Y plane, you're hitting a sinkhole that occur in the middle of that quadrant. Whereas, when you're going just beyond that, behind it, in the third quadrant here, you're really having a rapid mound come up. Okay, well, let's twist this thing a little bit from X, Y, right? More like this. Y that way and X this way. Twist it a little bit this way so this part is the coming toward you, twisting around this way, and the mound is twisting back behind it, and this is how it looks. Now, it seems like to me you should see a little bit of this, but it must be hidden by that. Um, but you see, you, you've 
now got the heat resistance behind the z-axis just a little bit, not much, and it's in the third quadrant there. Not squarely in there, it looks like there's a little bit of a cancer there. Now, that is a real function, okay? Z is equal to e to the minus x squared minus y squared minus e to the minus x minus 1 squared minus y minus 1 squared, okay? Um, this is the one that I think is going down this way. And this part is, is that right? I'd have to do some figuring on it, but there, there's no way I'll look at this and say, oh, that picture's like this. You know, it's just too esoteric to, to handle. Um, now, this is the negative part that's going down because the E function is always positive. Okay? And here you're subtracting. Uh, positive value and uh, so this is the this is the downside here and this is the upper side. Okay. And this is almost centered at xy x equal y. In fact both of these are along the axis x equal y of the identity function axis. Okay? But again, there's no way I can look at that. When they show me the picture, I can sort of rationalize it. But if you had me do it from scratch, not a clue, okay? There's just too many moving parts, okay? Now, I mentioned the traces. That's what they're focusing on here. All right. If I can get all this on one slide. Close. I think I've got it. Okay. Mm. They don't give us a function for this one. It's just some shape, circle. Okay. Now, if you had done horizontal traces here, you would have had circles or ellipses here and here and one down here. You wouldn't have been able to tell which was this except by looking at what time period you're talking about. They're focusing here on the vertical traces. That x equals some constant a. In other words, this is a plane parallel to the yz plane that you come out the x-axis a unit here and uh, have a bend. Or if a was negative, you so these are your vertical traces. This is the one at x equal a. This is a minus 1, a minus 2, a minus 3. And you keep working your way back until it looks like that might be 0 right there. And then negative and negative and negative. So these would be your vertical traces parallel to the yz plane. This is parallel to the x z plane. This is the last one there. Uh, this is the one where it just flies equal to b. I see. I'm sorry, I said this wrong. This is where x equal a, and these are further out with x greater than a, these are less x less than a, x negative, and on like this. Um, this is y is equal to b is this dark curve there. Y is equal to something a little bit greater than b. B comes out this way, a little bit less than B goes that way. That looks like that could possibly be where uh, things are you know, sort of in concert there. And then the further back you get, you get more of a functional distortion there. 
and I some of these curves here. I don't know if this is part of the back curve and this is part of the back curve. It looks like they could be. Uh, and this back curve here, the curve that comes up and goes down up like that. So you, you really have to twist your eyes around to see uh, those, that those are your vertical traces with various values lies with the sub B textures of the sun A. Okay. Now, you might say, we did this before, didn't we? Well, why are we doing it now? Um, we're doing generic shapes. These are not just your quadric surfaces. These are just any old shapes here. We're doing the same traces on them, but what we're getting going to get to is your derivatives in T or more independent variables. Okay. Now, this is one of these sort of weird figures you really can't do a whole lot with. Uh, so, you just do what you can. Uh, here, some sort of a Sheet a surface. Uh, Z is equal to some function of x and y. And back here is a function. Z is equal to x times the sine of y. Okay. Now, when I look at that and you sort of start thinking of that, certainly when x is equal to zero, z is equal to zero. When y is equal to zero, z is equal to zero. Okay. So these two lines here are on that surface, okay? But, if you have x fixed and y enables y to, to vary coming out, basically your x becomes what? <coughs> Sorry, whatever the, that value is that's coming out the x-axis, or going back to the x-axis, that basically acts like your amplitude. So when you're a little ways out, this is a sine curve that just has, doesn't have a lot of amplitude. Further out this way, it gets bigger and bigger amplitude as you come out because your x is increasing its amplitude. Now, you cut it this way um, and do your vertical traces. I'm sorry, vertical traces parallel to the Y and Z plane, and this is the same curve here, it's just showing the traces differently, and it looks like every one of those, for any fixed value for Y, that's some number, right? And you just have some slope of, you have Z is equal to 7X. 3x minus 4x or something like that, or thirds x or something like that. So these are all straight lines. You know, they may be different slopes depending on where, whether y is positive or negative. Remember, y is usually measured in radians. So the, if they're positive, they're going up. If they're positive, they're going up like this because z and x, which is positive x and positive z, going like this, and if y, sine y is negative, then it's pushing down that way. Okay. Now all those traces are straight lines uh, with different slopes. All these are sine curves with different amplitudes. So that's how you sort of analyze these vertical traces. Okay. Okay. Now, Oh man, that was example three. I didn't turn the page in time. I thought they were just showing us more like the last couple of slides were, but that was actually example three. It says, describe the vertical traces of f of x, y equal 
at sine y. Okay. I just did it, but just to, to show you how you would do it if you're doing from scratch. Vertical traces, left, left, um, x equal a sub constant this way. Coming out a of out at the back end. Okay. Then that is if the like your amplitude a sine y. So if a is a big number, then you have huge amplitude. A is a smaller number, you have more reasonable amplitude. And if a were equal to zero, uh, then you have a straight line down the y axis. Okay. Negative, where it has this, your peak is here. Here your peak is the valley. So everything sort of reflects across the, the y-axis as well. If this is going up, that one's going down. If this one's going down, this one's going up. Down, up, up, down. Okay. And then, as we already pointed out, if y is b, and that's a constant, and sine b is a constant, that's the slope of the y. If it's positive, it would be something like this, negative. Okay, sorry. All right, this I think is example four then. Okay. All right. Identifying features of a graph. Match the graphs in figure nine with the following functions. Okay, so one of these needs to be, well, they're showing you what they are. Here are the functions. Oh, if I go to the right, I lose it, so we lose it. Okay. But I think you can still see that. Uh, okay. Get my pen back. Okay. All right. F of XY is equal to x minus y squared. And the other is g of x, y is equal to x squared minus y. Okay. Now, whew, my hands are cold. All right. Let's imagine that we had um, so we, we've got the orientation this way. Okay? So let's say we were at fixed values for x. x equal 1, 2, 3, negative 4, but, you know, whatever it is. Then what would we have here? b would be a function of minus y squared, which sure looks like this, okay, plus 1 or minus 1. So sure enough, this, uh, the constant here would be increasing to positive x and decreasing to minus x, and you have a minus y squared, which is up and down, it's right or up and down. So this must be this one. It sure looks like it to me. Whereas that one, it's a positive x squared, so for a fixed y, your positive x squared would be parabolas that are opening upward, and uh, minus y, so this would be decreasing as y is getting more negative, increasing as it's going more positive. So yeah, this looks like that. And you look at that by the traces uh, along, and generally it's better to pick this as being your constant, you know, when you have more, because you can tell more about a squaring function than a pentalinear function just looking at it. You have lots of straight lines you could have there, but this shows the, the curvature of the graph. So this would have to be this one, and this would have to be that one. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I've already
already used the term contour maps when I was talking about your uh, horizontal traces. That's exactly what they are. Are y'all familiar with the concept of a contour map at all? You are? Okay. Um, it basically shows hills and valleys. It, it's a flat map, but you have the, the lines where you call them um, iso. Second. Iso. I want to say L's, but that's not it. Your elevations are all the same. And that's. ISO bars would be barometric pressure lines would be the same. ISO. Ooh, I can't think of the suffix there for for uh, a contour map. What it would be. It's in there, but it just won't quite come out. Okay, so that's what your horizontal traces will be. They will be showing these uh, places where you have equal elevations. Okay. Now, here we've got one with two mounds and a sinkhole. Okay. So, the plane itself, uh, this is the shape. Here's the XY plane for Z is equal to zero. Uh, here's the plane above that something greater than zero, um, and a variety of things. But down here at z is equal to zero, this doesn't cut it at all. So there are no things. Now this would be f of x equals c, and you come up here, yeah, there's an intersection there and there. Now I'm guessing these are more ellipses. They could be circles. It's hard to tell with the slant and the perspective you have here. But if z is equal to c, something greater than zero, you're up here. Something less than zero, you would be down here, or a smaller number. So you can have certain ellipses down here representing these things. Uh, up here, all you can have is, at most, circles or ellipses in two places, uh, because it doesn't cut it anywhere else. These are called Equal elevation, isocline. These are positive, it looks like here, these down here would be negative. Okay? Or less positive than those. And this would be where it's, okay, whatever your equilibrium you might take on to be. Uh, these would be wherever the function takes on the values C, where Z is equal to C or F of X, Y is equal Down here, it would be a single circle there. Okay, those are your horizontal traces, and that's the type of thing you use for contour maps. That's not the only thing it could be. I've mentioned barometric pressure. If you've ever seen a weather map, you see usually around highs you have, if they're not circles, they're, they're closed shapes. And around a low pressure, you have closed shapes. And they would identify which are highs and which are lows. Like if you're looking at this, you don't know if these are low places, dips, or if they're mountains. You know, you have to see this to tell which they are. But you can tell by saying, what's the value for C? If it's well above sea average, those are sea, sea level, those would be mountains. If they're way below sea level, that would be uh, depression. Like you might have there. Okay. Now, here's another multi Okay. Let's see if I can get as much as possible here. Goodness, my eyes hurt. 
Okay, I can't quite get everything. That looks like about as close as I can get. Okay, so here's your shape. Again, two mounds and one depression. Okay, doubt if this is the same one we had before. Uh, so it could be. Could be. But it doesn't really matter. Okay. If you were to do a horizontal trace of this, and you set x equal to some value, well, what they've done here, this is more like a contour map. They've done several of them. Okay? It looks like That these here, these lines here, that one and this one, would be basically is kind of what I would call the equilibrium. What the place where, if you go far enough out, it flattens out there. Okay. Now, where would be that flat? Flattest part of this in the this line here isn't quite as flat as it should be, but that's getting close. But somewhere just a little bit side of it, you can almost say flat, not very much, and that's this one. Okay, going back this way. Well, that's going to be hard to find one. It looks like possibly this one going here until it, it almost crosses that one and then it stops because it goes way up there. Okay? So, looks like you might could have had another one way back here and that would have been one. Then one that came like this. So they could have put another one in like that. Okay. Now, let's move up just a little way, and you would go around here, and around there, around there, and here. And that would be your, I don't know what you would call that, almost a figure eight, fat figure eight. Go up a little bit more, and you don't have, you broken the continuity there. Just have a lift around this one, lift around that. One. That would be those, then those, then these, and this one goes a little bit higher, so it has some circles up here that are not on that one. Or if you go to the depression area and do your circles around here and further and further, you're zooming in on the minimum point there, zooming in on the maximum here, and a relative maximum there. Okay. So that's what you see with these contours or horizontal traces. Okay? Now, why all that? Okay. This, I think, is example five. Or at least figure 12 is here. Let's see if I can get that to zoom in. Yuck. Okay, that's about the best I'm going to do there. Okay, and didn't do it as badly as I thought it would. Okay, sketch the contour map of f of x equal x squared plus 3y squared and comment on the spacing of the contour lines, contour curves. Okay? Well, obviously, this one right down here is t is equal to. to uh, T is equal to zero. Then it come down this the x is zero, y is zero, z is zero. Okay? Z will never, ever, ever go negative. If 
because he's burying this, he's burying that. But it can't go negative. Okay? Zero is as low as it can go, and that's the vertex, you might say, down there. That's underneath here. And you can't see it because it's saying that it's underneath there for the minimum value. Okay. Now, because you have, it's kind of looks backwards. Yeah, if you were to divide everything by three, this would be uh, g over three, x squared over three, and y squared. Your um, this is your two major axes here, the the x axis, okay, and the y axis is your minor axis. I'm going to look a little backwards, but I guess I got it right. Now, if you were to go up, it says comment on the spacing. They don't give you any, uh, ooh, we're out of town, Mark. Yeah. Sorry about that. We will pick up and do this one, example five, next time. Now, this is a lot of blah, blah, blah so far today. Sorry about that. Uh, but, Hopefully you'll see in the subsequent sections why they do this, okay? But I think you could do exercises uh, one or three or both. At least give them a shot. Uh, any of the odds five through 11, 13 or 15 or both. Seventeen or nineteen or both. And try to do some of the odds twenty one to twenty five. And we'll come back and pick up on the contour maps twenty seven when we do that example five. Good deal. We'll get more qualitative quantitative next time. This has been mostly qualitative today, so We'll get a bit more quantitative, which I know is what you like, love. Okay. So let's end the slideshow, discard, and get out of this. Oh, I need to end this.